Hello everybody, my name is Ratnos and today I want to talk about some 9.1 stuff that uh, has been learned over the past several hours. Uh, so I guess, well, late yesterday probably by the time I get this video out. Uh, so we had a big interview between content creator Sloot and lead game designer Morgan Day, uh, which I'll have a link to this Wowhead article, which in turn has a link to the VOD of that. Very uh, cool thing to check out if you're interested. And this article also summarizes the stuff that was discussed in here. Uh, and I want to go through and give some takes on some of these bits. Uh, and also, I mean, so I'll have some takes and I'll also just help summarize it uh, if you're interested in, in that. Although, of course, watch the whole thing uh, is something I definitely recommend. Uh, so TLDR, what's happening with Torghast? In addition to the stuff that's already been announced, which is, you know, there's a new currency for ranks 5 and 6 of your legendaries from the new layers. They're making the old layer stuff a lot easier in terms of getting the getting your legendaries up to rank 4. Uh, so the Soul Ash part, 50% uh, more uh, is going to drop, plus you're going to get extra if you can do those new layers as well. Um, and you can get smaller amounts on repeat wins, so you might be able to just farm it up you know, by doing 8 Torghasts in one week rather than 6 Torghasts over 3 weeks, uh, as you do now or whatever. Uh, and you can also transfer Soul Ash to Alt. It looks like you're going to lose a little bit in the process here, but... Uh, this is a nice little way as well, although I don't know really how much this helps most folks, because, uh, I don't know, I, I, I've never farmed Soul Ash on a character without having the intent to use it on something, because I'm not, I'm not about that, but maybe there are some people who have a stockpile built up on a character and want to be able to send it on to others. Uh, either way, the this is doesn't really help with the new ranks of the legendaries anyways, the ranks 5 and 6 uh, of legendaries uh, are going to require a new currency that it looks like isn't going to have all of these kind of uh, easing up of, of mechanics for, which kind of makes sense. Um, class balance stuff. Uh, so in terms of philosophy, they want to, they want to do more tuning and they want to avoid nerfs outside of the first couple weeks, which I think makes a lot of sense. And they, they did a pretty good job of that so far. Uh, buff the more underperforming specs. We have seen some of that happening. Um, I would say that this patch has had quite a good amount of that. The only reason that it kind of feels right now like it hasn't is because the metagame is incredibly stale because the patch has lasted for, you know, six or seven years now. Um, <laughs> we're deep we're deep into patch 9.0, and so I, I think that uh, had this patch been not such a long content drought, uh, it probably wouldn't have felt so stale as, as the metagame does right now. Uh, at least that's my that's my read on it. Um, so, okay, Death Knight PvP talents, don't know anything about that. Miss Weaver Numerical stuff, probably buffs if I had to guess there, which... I think are warranted, and I'm excited to see. Holy Paladin damage tuning. There I would guess probably more nerfs than buffs, but also glad to see that here. It's a little bit weird, because I think that it's really Venthyr they've got a target with that, but so few Holy Paladins actually play Venthyr, but it's so, so good for, like, high-level content that, I don't know, it's such a weird problem. Like, this is something that people were talking about when the Covenant system was announced, was this, like, possibility of there being a different most fun covenant from like best covenant for you and that didn't really pan out except for holy paladins uh, for holy paladins there's a huge difference between the most fun covenant which is kyrian which is what most people play and the best covenant which is venthyr which is what you know you play for uh high-end mythic rating you know hall of fame stuff or uh trying to push world first keys any of that kind of stuff um so it's definitely a little interesting paradigm there where it's kind of hard to figure out what they should do with Holy Paladin without, like, just taking a nerf bat and smashing Ash and Hallow into the ground. Um, okay, other changes, of course, as well. Encounter design, and this is a great point here. Class design discusses with encounter design and combat design uh, because it has a huge effect on class balance. And I talk about this a lot. Um, the same classes put into, you know, Tuma Sargeras or Nighthold uh, versus being put into, you know, Azhar's Eternal Palace... Uh, or even Castle Nather, right? They, they all have these different uh, textures, right? What are the last bosses in particular? What do they prioritize? Are they single target encounters? Are they burst damage oriented? Uh, is there heavy one shot based damage coming out? Is there stuff you can immune for profit? Uh, and whether or not those things are true is often way more important for what specs are good and what specs you see a lot of in Race to World First in particular. Uh, than, you know, how much damage those specs are doing. Although, of course, that's important too, but I think that's something that is not uh, understood widely enough uh, when it comes to discussions of the metagame. 
Um, it's the kind of thing that is never captured by something like the SimCraft charts that come out every every patch, but is hugely important. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously it's it's good that they think that as well. Good that they agree with me there. I love it, love it when people agree with me. Um, specific class tuning. So multiple types of problems, a tuning problem and design, a design problem. So with Holy Priest, if you haven't heard about this, instead of thinking there's a tuning problem there necessarily, they've tried to do a design solution instead, which is they've given them this button where when you press it, it reduces everybody's defensive cooldown by one minute. Uh, so like Icebound Fortitude, I think, and th those sorts of buttons, right? The Holy Priest presses it, and then everybody in their raid gets a minute off of some defensive button uh, in their kit, uh, which is a pretty cool, cool effect, a cool identity, and yeah, might give them a new niche. Um, whether or not that, you know, lands is an interesting thing, but uh, I could see moving to a world where all 36 specs have something in that kind of AMZ, uh, you know, the, the, those sorts of defining abilities, Spirit Link Totem, uh, these effects that you're just like, wow, this is this is powerful. And I think, you know, Mystic Touch, Chaos Brand, uh, you can sort of put them there as well when you're designing a raid roster. Um, so I think that, that this is insightful. I, I do... I'm skeptical that this particular Holy Priest uh, effect is going to be competitive with the identity of your Discipline Priest and Holy Paladin in Raid, which is uh, they provide damage reduction and they provide damage for free as part of their rotation. Uh, and I think that as long as those remain the identities of those two specs, it's going to be hard to see them edged out uh, on, on a big scale by the other specs, uh, at least in top end play. Uh, yeah, Miss Reaper numbers tune, Holy Paladin damage changes, some Venthyr changes to Ash and Hallow. Uh, I think, of course, it is important for high end play if you don't want to see seven Holy Paladins. I guess you won't see seven, but if you don't want to see more than 50% of healers in raid and 100% of healers in dungeons uh, being, whole, being Venthyr Holy Paladins, it's definitely important. Uh, AMZ is something they're looking at, something like a cap that the amount of damage it can absorb. Um, so this would be a good way to go about nerfing it so that it's not as, as potent of a Mythic Raid tool while still being something that is useful in most forms of content. You know, if it, if it can just only absorb 100,000 damage or something, 50,000 damage, uh, and then it, it poofs, uh, that would be something that would be a, a, a proportional nerf that, you know, be a 0% nerf for most, most content, and then for Mythic Raiding it would scale up to 50-75% nerf depending on what mechanic you're using it against. Um, Depend I think it's it's a, a scary thing to try and balance something like AMZ, but I, I do think that if I was Blizzard, I would err on the side of nerfing it too much rather than too little, because right now, uh, looking at raid roster, like I, I think that something like five melee slots for Witcher Death Knights is is what I'm kind of foreseeing next year, and I think that's uh, that should be that should be worn there should be klaxons blazing. Uh, in the balance team, and AMZ is the big culprit there. Uh, some of the dot classes are doing the best on single target fights, which is weird, so they're shifting their damage profile. Yeah, this is something I noticed with um, with Shadow Priest in particular this tier. was It's so weird that Shadow Priest is this spec that, you know, is a single target blaster and is not good at, at you know, cleave, uh, when historically these kind of multi-dotting specs are really, really good at cleave, uh, and they can do good single target, especially when there are adds to get resources off of, uh, but this time around, that was kind of the, I guess, the, just the expansion level balance and design of those specs changed that. Um, and it looks like they're trying to change that back. So I think it makes sense. Okay, raid utility. They want to give everybody something, uh, you know, cool. I, I'd I would like to see that as well. I, I, I would love to see all 36 specs being competitive. My belief is that when you're looking at, like, eight specs that have something really powerful and important that they bring and you know 20 28 that don't it's a lot easier to take that eight down to zero than it is to take it up to 36 but uh i understand that they want to they want to do it the other way um conduits conduit ranks will increase so then they might gain two to four new ranks which is it's kind of weird because if they kept it would be two ranks if it was just up in 26 item levels uh, in the same way as it is right now. So maybe there will be some new kind of conduit ranking system. Maybe they'll subdivide it further so that a rank is seven item levels instead of 13. Or six or seven item levels, I guess. It's, kind of, it's so weird. Dude, it's so weird, this expansion, that it's 13 item level steps and the half step is either six or seven, uh, depending. It's so weird. I, I hate it so much. 
Uh, BOEs, yeah, I, I, BOEs are one of my biggest problems in Castle Nathria, so I'm glad to see that this is something that they are, uh, they are adjusting, you know, coming into this tier, they were like, yeah, we're gonna make, we're gonna make gear a lot less common, and then they also made it so that, so, you, you know, you're getting like a third as much gear from all your other sources, and you're getting twice as much gear from BOEs, uh, and, you know, four slots in your, in your character came from BOEs, that's like multiple weeks of, of clearing raid, uh, from, you know, shelling out 5 million gold, which you could do with WoW tokens as well, so uh, it's added a serious pay-to-win element to the game that uh, definitely made me uncomfortable, so I'm glad they're looking at reducing that. I would love to see, I mean, whatever the smallest number they are okay with for that is the number that I hope they go with. Uh, weapon tokens. This is something that there's been a lot of discussion about. Weapon tokens were made to provide Covenant transmog weapons off of Denathrius. And that's how it works, right? You get your weapon token and then you turn it into your order hall. Uh, and so you get your Covenant Transmog. But in Sanctum of Domination, you will take her bow off her corpse. Uh, and the loot layout is intentional, mostly finished, no plans to provide more weapons off the final two bosses to shore up the specs that don't have a weapon off the final two bosses. All right, so here are the items that you can get at 233. I guess not 233, but 233 equivalent. The, uh, you know, extra item level bump uh, from Sylvanas and from Kel'Thuzad in Sanctum of Domination. They are a shield... There's a legendary bow, uh, there's an agility dagger, an int staff, and a strength sword, a two-handed strength sword. So if you are a spec that cannot use these things, you know, say you are a, uh, a Windwalker monk, for instance, or a, a demon hunter, uh, you are not going to get access to these highest item level weapons. Now the answer that they give here for why this is going to be the case um, you know, they, they, they're, I think that they were, they were saying about how it's, you're taking her bow off her corpse and, uh, you know, you're taking these items off these bosses, um, and this is, this is intentional, right? Uh, but I do think this is a problem, and I, I think that this is something that, uh, it's, it's gonna kind of suck. And I think it's gonna suck not just for Mythic Raiders, not just for the people who are, who are ever going to kill Mythic Kel'Thuzad and Mythic Sylvanas. I think it's gonna suck if you're somebody who's gonna kill them on Heroic as well, because... How many of you had, you know, 220 weapons from Sire, or uh, I guess offhands from SLG, being a part of your character's gear for some percentage of this patch? Uh, for me, that was a, a vital part of my character's gear progression. Uh, for most of Mythic progression, I was wearing those. Um, and this, is this now means that if you are a spec that can use one of these weapon types versus specs that can't, uh, that is is going to be a gap, right? It means that you're going to be stuck on 213 equivalent instead of 220 equivalent uh, until you can get up to that 226 drop from somewhere in the Mythic raid. Um, and so that, I think, is is a shame. I think it's also going to have implications for the eventual, you know, key pushing meta uh, where it's, you know, like if you, if you look back at Nazoth, right? There are these specs like Elisham and Mistweaver Monk that just never could get a 233 equivalent weapon, right? The extra bonus item level bump um, from Nazoth or Carapace because it just didn't exist. Uh, and eventually, I, I do believe that that led to lower, you know, usability for them in the metagame. I think that the item levels on your weapons, for a lot of specs, is, is pretty important. Um, and so, I don't, I, I don't really have this take as like a Mythic Plus versus Raid perspective. I, I, I see on Twitter there's sort of an argument about oh, you know, the raid loot should be better, and I, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with the last two bosses dropping higher item level gear. I just wish it was for all specs. I wish that uh, the weapons were done in a way that were for all specs. Now, I understand having the legendary bow be from Sylvanas, right, and be an important thematic drop, but I don't know what the Agi Dagger, the Int Staff, the Two-Handed Strength Sword, or the Shield are doing thematically that is worth causing the gameplay damage. I think that you could have a system, uh, either tokens, or you could have, like, upgrade tokens that drop from... from uh, Kel'Thuzad and from Sylvanas that let you upgrade loot the drop from earlier bosses, right? Up to that extra Mythic Plus item. Not Mythic Plus, obviously, that, that means something else. Uh, but Mythic extra, extra item level, right? The very top item level. Uh, you get a, a token that lets you empower one of those earlier items. Um, and you could still keep the Legendary Bow Drop, or maybe you could make it even so that uh, the bow drops as epic with no activated effect, and then if you also then empower it with the... Uh, the thing, it gets that legendary imbued power. I don't know. I, I, I think that there are a lot of ways that they could preserve the uh, the lore that they're looking for here without uh, cannonballing the gameplay in the way that I I, I feel like this does. Um, 
I understand that for a lot of players, the problem will stop once you get your 226 equivalent from Mythic Raid, uh, because you're never hoping to, you know, you're going to kill a couple Mythic bosses, you're never going to kill Mythic Sylvanas, Mythic Kel'Thuzad. Um, but I still, I mean, I still think there are going to be a lot of people who are on the, their heroic raid weapons for a long time, and whether those are 220 equivalent or 213 equivalent uh, is going to make a big difference. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm disappointed by this answer, and I hope they reconsider. Uh, okay. Let's move on. Loot, pretty happy with four pieces of loot per boss. Might have gone a bit too far. I actually, I forget whether they're saying that they went, which direction they went too far. I think they meant when they cut down on loot. Uh, they might have gone a bit too far with that. Shards of Domination. Okay, this bit's really cool. So these are gems that drop in the raid, and then they fit into special sockets of gear that drops in the raid. Um, and basically there's three different flavors of gem and then three different, you know, types of gem. Uh, so there are the blood, unholy, and frost gems. And then there's also healing, survival, and damage gems. Uh, and they're each unique equipped. And there are five total uh, slots you can get onto your gear uh, of domination sockets. And once you equip three of the same type, which means in this case, blood, unholy, or frost, you'll get a set bonus, which ha we don't know what those are yet. Um, effect as well. So presumably if that's if that's pushed, if that's a powerful thing, you're going to want to collect probably like three blood shards and then maybe the unholy damage shard and the frost damage shard if you're a damage dealer, or maybe the you know unholy healing and frost healing one if you're a, a healer, or maybe some mix, right? Maybe if you're a tank, you, you kind of take a, a smorgasbord of the most powerful looking effects. And this is the effects here. So uh, the unholy ones, the healing one is uh, you can you have a chance to make your healing target drain health from nearby enemies. Uh, I don't know how this is going to work in terms of AoE, but this might be a pretty potent DPS increase, uh, even in that healing shard spot for healers. The survival one is a speed increase, so pretty unexciting there. Uh, and the damage one is damaging a target, increases your damage done to that target by 0.5% for 4 seconds, stacking up to 5 times. This is a sizable damage increase for a gem, right? Uh, this ends up being a 2% damage increase from socketing this thing, so... Uh, it kind of cements my perspective that regardless of whether you're going for unholy frost or blood, you're going to want this uh, this one in here. If you probably, I mean, probably even healers and tanks will be aiming to will be gunning to slot those in eventually. If I had to guess, um, then okay, the frost ones, the healing one is your crit heals cause the target to absorb the next uh, 442 damage dealt to them within six seconds. So potentially a nice little throughput increase for for healers that crit reasonably often. Uh, the survival one is while standing still gain a nice. A little absorb shield every five seconds uh, up to a cap of 1100 so potentially interesting although how often players are actually standing still uh, you know they've, they've kind of done this design around standing still there's some of it in like the general draven soulbind tree uh, and it always performs less well than you'd think uh, you're, you're, you're just moving so often in this game especially whenever there's any actual hard content where you would be most interested in having this uh, frost damage one, your damage is increased by 5% for 10 seconds after attacking an enemy you've not yet damaged. So a nice little buff on the opener, a nice little useful thing on fights where there are fresh adds coming in. Uh, so potentially very strong there. I mean, 5% for 10 seconds could be a huge deal if that's stacking up, if, that, if you're refreshing that often on new enemies. Um, so again, the damage shard looking, looking nice here. Uh, and then, okay, so the blood ones, the blood healing one, a leech increase. Uh, actually something that healers and tanks are usually usually pretty jazzed about is, is getting any any leech they can find. So depending on what number it is, uh, that will be good. The survival one, incoming healing you receive is increased by 1% and your maximum health is increased. I assume it won't be by 2, I assume that's a placeholder number here. Uh, but 1% increase on incoming healing is, you know, it's not nothing. Um, although it, it's, not, it's not a huge deal either. And then the blood damage one. Your damage is increased by 8% when you have 50% or more health than your target. I assume this is supposed to be like 50% or more more health than your target, as I assume how that's supposed to read. Uh, kind of weird. Um, but if that, if it does work that way, if it means that, so like say I'm at 70% health and you're at 20% health, then this thing is triggering. Uh, actually, depending on how you read this, maybe it's... I actually don't... I, I, I have no idea whether it would work that way or whether it's like you know, 50% of their health on top of it. Yeah, whatever. Uh, as long as this is active when you're, like, topped or close to topped against enemies that are sub, you know, 30% health, which I assume it would be, 
Uh, this will be a potent execute damage increase and also probably a sizable overall damage increase as well. Um, so this one, I mean, 8% is a large number here. 8% uh, increased damage in execute phase is a huge deal for a lot of raid fights. This one is going to own. Uh, this one, I think, is the one that looks the most compelling to me. Uh, although all the damage ones look good. So yeah, my, my read on this is you'll play, for most damage dealers and damage-oriented tanks and healers, you'll play damage, 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 and then the survival and healing ones of whichever set bonus you want, probably. Uh, okay. Let's take a look at the rest of the stuff we got here. Uh, oh, okay, and so here's how that works again. The individual bonuses work anywhere, and the set bonus only works in the Maw and in the Raid. Um, so that's... If you're, you're curious about how that works, that, that's important to know about how that, they do. No plans to change 20-man Mythic. Uh, no mini-raids this expansion. Good mini-raids. Uh, I love the bosses they've had in mini-raids in the past, but I think that there a lot of people like didn't engage with Crucible, and you could have just put those two bosses at the end of BOD, and that would have been probably better, uh, and people wouldn't have had... There, there were a lot of guilds that were just like checked out and didn't even try uh, Mythic Council or Mythic Unot ever. Which is a shame because that fight was that, that fight was awesome, uh, but yeah, I, th I think that making great fights is good, but just do them at the end of lo nice long raids with a, a lot of nice filler bosses that uh, that mean every guild is working on something compelling, and there's not just content that comes out that is only for high end guilds. Uh, is the jailer the final boss of the expansion? And basically a non-answer. So I don't know. Uh, I mean, they're kind of suggesting it is here, but I'm sure that they would say this regardless of whether it is or not. Anyways, no mythic only phase in Sylvanas, and the big story elements for an expansion should be played out in the raid. So this is kind of an interesting departure from Gul'dan in Nighthold, where the Gul'dan, like the canon storyline of what happens in that fight, is, uh, it's what happens in the mythic version, right? That's, that's where the actual canon storyline happens. That's where Illidan comes down, right? Uh, and you break him out, so. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't really have a super strong feeling about this. I think Mythic-only phases are sweet, but should be done when they have a, a good idea and a good a good design for it. I think if you look at a fight like Nazoth, you can see what a uninspired Mythic-only phase does, and I think it does more harm than good. Um, so I'm glad that they... I don't know, I think, that, I think they should do it whenever they can come up with a good idea for it. Um, but I think just the, the mythic fights can be great without needing a mythic only phase. M plus affixes, um, they agree with a lot of the feedback they've got. Okay, well, I'm curious to hear which feedback that is they're agreeing with, because I know everybody yells about different parts of M plus, but hopefully they agree with my feedback uh, exactly and nobody else's. Um, starting to explore affixes with Kiss Curse with seasonal affixes, and they might want to completely revisit one of the buckets if things play out well. This is one of the most exciting lines for me uh, from this interview because. You could imagine a world where they like change one of the buckets, so like the level four affixes or the level seven affixes, such that you know they still challenge you, but when you do them right, they reward you in some way, right? So you could think of it like you know, what if when you kill an explosive orb, it refunds you some health or mana or gives you a damage buff or something? Um, you know, that's that's the kind of kiss curse idea, right? Is that there's uh, some sort of little side quest that's offered to you by by an affix and then by doing it by taking on that challenge by succeeding you end up getting some kind of benefit that uh, ends up helping you i think awakened did a really good job of that at the end of bfa uh prideful i'm a little bit less jazzed about because I, I don't like the kind of rigidity that it's added to routes where i felt like awakened opened everything up i feel like prideful has done a lot of kind of closing decision trees and making it so that any route that doesn't do like hit a 20 percent threshold at the perfect spots uh, ends up just being easily identifiable as just being strictly worse than the ones that do. So I think that's an important thing to think of with seasonal affix design. But I think that changing non-seasonal affixes to be Kiss Curse as well is a really sweet and good idea. If someone's M-plus rating, that's the new Raider IO score that they're putting in-game. Uh, rating increases in an, a Mythic Plus dungeon you complete. You'll receive bonus Valor in the chest at the end. This is sweet. I'm going to use this to trick people into carrying my rat alts through stuff. Um, just say, you know, you, you want some bonus valor from your weekly key. Uh, I'll just, I'll bring it. I, I, don't worry. I'll, I'll take on this sacrifice. I'll bring this character uh, so that it's a score increase for me and you'll get extra valor. No need to thank me. Uh, nothing to announce for the high end rewards, but with the rating system in place, they are able to look at who has the highest score in the season. Okay. I mean, that, you basically can already do that with the radar IO. So one hopes that they come up with good ways to uh, at least match all the functionality that radar IO has right now. Um, 
or if not, people will just continue to, you know, use Radar.io for those things, which is fine as well. I mean, Radar.io is a great site. Uh, very much love it, but I think that the Blizzard should definitely make sure that there's in-game versions of all the core functionality of the score right now. Uh, quick fire, increased catch-up system for 40 Renown. Sounds good. Release date for 9.1 soon. Cool. I, I don't know, I've heard this for a while now, and I don't see it on the horizon yet, so... Um, and I don't think they'll make it overlap with TBC Classic, so I bet we're still uh, a ways away, but I don't know, I hope it's soon. Um, such a long content drought. 500 match achievement, I... I know, okay. Um, plan changes to Great Vault, minor. Change to Jewelry for PvP. I think it would be cool if there were some, you know, way such that, like, if you get three slots in your Great Vault, there's there's ways that it's not just going to be like three necklaces or something, but I don't have a huge problem with Great Vault. I think Great Vault does a great job of uh, of fixing the problems of the weekly box in previous expansions, and I think that any suggestions for it are tinkering around the sides. Uh, heirlooms, not for 9-1. Okay. And, uh, yeah. They want to walk the fine line of catch-up and participate in activities, uh, but I also don't want to undermine the time that people have put into the game. This makes sense. I, I think that these kind of catch-up systems... It always feels like they're caught by surprise when people want there to be catch-up mechanics in their game. Um, and I wish that they would think about this kind of more in advance and design ahead of time, you know, a sort of scheduled way that the catch-up comes into play, um, rather than kind of having to patch it in in an unpredictable way, you know, three months into the patch, one or two patches into the expansion. Um, I wish they would instead be like, okay, you know, because I, I think everybody kind of, everybody kind of gets it. I don't think any of the high investment players, which I would count myself in there, really mind that like all the work I put in in the first month of the expansion ends up being, you know, they end up making it so you can catch up with that a little bit faster later later down the line. I think that's something that everybody kind of accepts, right? And the the benefit I got by doing all that grinding in the first month is I got to be powerful in the first month, right? I got to be, I got to have my character done first, right? And, uh, you know, eventually people later down the line can have a character catch up faster and with less overall effort than I did. But later on, right, if you want if you want it to be easier, you got to wait. Um, I think that people would be okay with that. I think Blizzard overestimates how much uh, bad, you know, energy there would be if they just made it so, you know, you could catch up. Like, say, say if they just made it so you could just keep running Torghast and get Soul Ash up to the, the total amount that you could have earned the same way that like Conquest works, right? Where it's just like a increasing seasonal cap. I think that people would have been totally fine with that. I don't think, I, I, I don't think people would have whined and been like, well, oh, but I did Torghast. I did it for four weeks, so everybody else should have to as well. I, I, I just don't, I don't think that that's as many people as they're worried about. And I don't think they should be listened to uh, as much. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my take on this interview. A lot of good stuff in here. Obviously, a lot of stuff that uh, I still have problems with, but, you know, that's life. Um, hope you like this video. Hope you like this little look at, at what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, there's also been some new Covenant-specific legendaries data mined that I uh, might make a video on, but I can see my WoW icon is flashing here, and it's one minute until raid time, so I gotta go raid and start my stream uh, at twitch.tv slash ratnos, so come check that out. Um, follow that there. Hit subscribe and stuff if you liked the video. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this one. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.